Essen Project 885. All right, our story begins in Leningrad in 1977. It's now known as St. Petersburg, Russia. Project 885 begins when the United States commissions its first fourth generation nuclear submarine, a 688 class Los Angeles fast attack. This is the new, you know, Cold War, the best America's got to offer 1977, and the Russians want to answer this. So they, they get the money, they send it to the design bureau, and they're like, build us a submarine. Well, they originally have three ideas for submarines. They're thinking an anti-sub submarine, one specific just for that, an anti-aircraft carrier submarine, which is their way of saying anti-ship submarine, a missile carrying submarine like an SSGN, and then a multi-purpose submarine, one that would do both have a little bit of both. Uh, in 1985, this is like eight years later, chief designer paid off at the Malachite Design Bureau that designs a lot of these other submarines as well, says, you know what, we're just gonna focus on one submarine. We're gonna combine all these into a multi-purpose submarine, make it an SSGN, and it's gonna shoot the new supersonic Onyx missile, which in uh, 1977 wasn't even a thing yet. Uh, the Onyx missile came in operation in 1983, in the Russian military. But it's gonna shoot this new missile, this is in 1985 now, uh, from the submarine. That's the plan. So, hull one of this project is called the Severodnitsk, and it is one of one. They don't build another one, this is a unique submarine. One of the features of the submarine is it has what we call a 1.5 steel hull submarine. So what that means is, most Russian submarines have two hulls. They have an outer hull and they have a pressure hull. Inside the pressure hull is where all the equipment, weapons, and people are. The outer hull is simply an outer hull, and there's a gap in between these two. Well, the front part, like the front quarter of the Severodnitsk is a two-hull submarine. But at about the midpoint under the sail and going aft of that, it becomes a single-hull submarine. So it has a combination of two hull and one hull. So we've just called it a 1.5 hull submarine. There'll be some pictures that allow you to see this a little more clear. She's gonna have a pop-up rescue chamber like a lot of her previous submarines have from the Russian Navy. She's going to have eight VLS tubes capable of firing that Onyx anti-ship missile and the 1994 caliber land attack missile that is in development at, the, at this time. She'll have a revolutionary, first time for the Russian Navy, monoblock reactor design, which means the pressurizers and the coolant systems and the cycle systems are all in one big block all together right there. This saves uh, weight and space and a lot of things, very advanced monoblock design. And it's the first time they've done that. She'll have a single shaft with a screw, but two outboard auxiliary motors for emergency propulsion. And she'll have 10 torpedo tubes, 10 53 centimeter torpedo tubes, uh, canted outwards at about seven degrees uh, back from the hull. This is the first Russian submarine that doesn't have torpedo tubes protruding through the bow of the submarine. They come out the sides like American submarines do now. All right, Severodinsk by the numbers. Again, this is one of one. She's 120 meters long, which is about 40 feet longer than a 688. She's pretty long. Uh, she's even a little bit longer than the uh, Sea Wolf. She's 15 meters wide. 15 meters wide is wider than an Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine. She's thick. This is a big boat. She displaces 13,800 tons. Yeah, that's like two 688s. That's a lot of tonnage. She claims to go 31 knots. I'm not going to dispute that in this lecture. It's the best uh, evidence that I have says that she can do 31 knots despite all this weight. Uh, she can dive down to 600 meters test depth. That's just shy of 2,000 feet. She has the 10 torpedo tubes. She has six countermeasures. Four are mounted topside flush with the hull facing forward and two topside facing aft. She has a crew of about 90 sailors and uh, one shaft, seven bladed screw, making an amazing 50,000 horsepower, which would be about as much horsepower as you need to push around 14,000 tons at 31 knots. So there's no doubt that that number is pretty close. All right, Severinsk 
she uh, her keel is laid December 10th, 1993, and this is when she gets her name. She goes from being Project 885 to this specific hull being named the Sevrod Vinsk. In 1996, three years later, all work is suspended at the Sevmas shipyard. They've run out of money. They cannot continue working on it. This project is just suspended. It's not canceled. It's, it's lying in state at this point. 2004, work on the Project 885 and at the Sevmas shipyard is authorized again and workers get back to it. This ship has been sitting on its keel blocks since 1993. And a lot of these systems are degrading during this time because uh, there's a lot of half installed equipment you know, that only have half of its racks installed. The rest of it's just kind of hanging out for years and years. So there's a lot of degradation going on there. And a lot of these systems need to be ripped out again and reinstalled again, complicating and extending the production process of the Sevron Vinsk. In June 2010, she is finally launched and rolled out of dry dock. These submarines um, of this project aren't launched into the water like you may see older submarines are. They're simply rolled out on railway rails into a floating dry dock. Well, that happens in June 2010. All right, so here's a picture of her rolled out now. She's in that floating dry dock. We see the torpedo loading hatch now is on the port side instead of the bow. This is one of the, the big changes that they had made. The torpedo room now is moved aft from where it normally would be located on a Russian boat to underneath the sail, right you know, below the front of the sail there. They open up those loading hatches and they can load the torpedoes down into the torpedo room, which is below it. So that made NATO wonder, well, what's going on in the bow? Now that they don't have the torpedo tubes and the torpedo room up there, what's up there now? The answer is, for the first time, the Russian Navy had designed, engineered, and installed a sonar sphere. Instead of a sonar cylinder, which is a different type of sonar array, a sonar sphere is now taking up all the space in the bow. It is a very large sonar array, and it's round instead of cylindrical. That gives it more capability, and because of its sheer size, it gives it higher fidelity. And this is important. Larger sonar arrays don't see farther, but what they do see is clearer. So if they get a detection, it's pretty clear. Larger sonar arrays can see farther, but that is not exclusive to large sonar arrays. That's not a property of them. Okay, the main seawater scoop down there on the uh, starboard side sticking out of the hull, that is as the ship is driving through the water, water goes into that and feeds the main sea loop inside the engine room. And that's used for cooling and other things, um, but mostly cooling. And then the, the hot water after it's used is just pumped overboard aft of that. This is a very archaic design and it, they took the scoop idea that they had on the Sierra, the Akula and the Victor three, and they made the scoop bigger. So it's possible that these engine room systems just need more coolant water, uh, which would make sense with the large amount of horsepower we're talking about in this ship. But this is a, an identifying characteristic of the Severodinsk. If you see it in dry dock and you see this scoop sticking out, it's the Severodinsk. No other submarine, not even the ones that come after this one, have this. This is a one of one. All right, Severance missile testing begins in 2011. The caliber and the Onyx missiles have not been successfully tested, delaying delivery to the Russian Navy for another year. In August 2012, they've tried it again, and the Navy declares that the sea trials were successful, but will not be delivered to the Navy yet, pending further missile testing. Now, these missiles have been in operation in the Russian military for decades, and the Russian Navy is now telling us that it is these missiles that are not working properly, delaying the delivery of the submarine. It is likely that this is not true. What is more likely is that there is a problem with the submarine launching equipment itself causing this delay. But the official story from the Russian Navy is that it's the missiles, not the submarine. Everything is fine, comrade, on the submarine. It's not the submarine. But I'm here to tell you, it's probably the submarine. In November of the same year, a few months later, they do successfully test the Onyx anti-ship missile. 
All right, so Severnets missile testing continued into 2013, and in October, they did successfully test the Caliber missile again, and the next month, they tested the Onyx missile. And one way you can tell the difference between these two missiles when you see pictures or you have video of the launch is look at the parabolic state of the missile pictured on the right. That is a caliber missile being boosted out of the water. That is a land attack missile. There is a anti-ship variant, but this is primarily a land attack missile. And that's what it looks like when it's launched. The Onyx, on the other hand, is an anti-ship missile and it's supersonic. And whenever it comes out of the water, the booster engines have little vector thrusters on it that tip it over horizontal to the horizon in the direction of the target. So it only comes out of the water you know, a few dozen meters before it turns flat and races off over the horizon. And it is extremely fast missile, very capable, the Onyx missile. All right, Severance Rescue Pod Test. This is one of the crew's favorite because this is what's gonna save them if anything really bad happens. Uh, every submarine going back decades into the Cold War has had a rescue pod. They haven't always worked, they haven't always saved the crew, but it's a really good peace of mind to have them on board. And so that's why they do have them. And here's some pictures from the inside. You can see one of the benches there with the breathing apparatus um, equipment there. Now, every Russian submarine, whenever he's on board, whether he's in port or not, is wearing a breathing apparatus, emergency breathing apparatus. That's what that thing is that you see strapped across their body over their shoulder as they walk around in pictures and in video. It's emergency air breathing mask. But they have some extras in here just in case, you know, Obviously, if you're using this, something terrible has happened. Maybe not everybody has their breathing apparatus. There's some extras there. Uh, they have a hammer there mounted on the hull. They can take that out and hammer on the hatch to let people know that they're ready to be rescued. Or if they're you know, just bobbing around, they can uh, hammer on the hull and other submarines can probably in the vicinity could probably hear them uh, in there and get their location. Down at the bottom, you can see the submarine now, after the test has been successful, it's returning to port without the rescue pod. So she is capable of operating without it. And she pulls up next to the pier where the crane simply reattaches the rescue pod on. This all happened in 2014, uh, right off the coast of the Kola Peninsula. All right, Severance deep sea trials. Once they have the missile test done and they got the rescue pod tested, they're ready to go all the way down to test depth. So in March 2015, uh, they dive to test depth and they exercise the torpedo tubes. Now, this means that they just shoot water through the torpedo tubes. They don't actually shoot a torpedo at test depth at this time. But what they do is they come shallow again. They get onto a torpedo range, which is in the Barents Sea. There's one in the White Sea too, but in the Barents Sea is where they did this. And they shoot 53 centimeter torpedoes, including a rocket torpedo. They shot one of those, which uh, that's rare to see one of those go off. And she also successfully tested all of her communication systems, satellite, you know, radar, all those masts and antennas that come out of the sail. All that was successfully tested in March 2015. And the general director of the Malachite Design Bureau finally declared publicly during an interview with media that the Severodensk was fully functional and ready for deployment in 2015. Now, keep in mind, at this time, she had been part of the Navy for a couple years, but now she's ready to go because she's completed all these milestones. All right, so let's talk about Severodensk operations. Uh, she hasn't done much. Yeah, so in April 2016, she partakes in the annual, you know, naval games that happen right there in the Barents Sea. She does launch some missiles, so she's out there doing her thing. I believe, and this is my opinion, I have nothing to back this up other than my own experience, that in 2016, it is highly likely that a Royal Navy submarine or an American submarine was in the Barents at the time of these missile launches, because that's what we do. And uh, this would be a great opportunity to just observe her operating and learn how she operates and also get some details about what systems make what noises so that if you hear that out in the middle of the Atlantic, you'll know what it is. Well, she does this 2016, 2017, 2018, each time taking part in these exercises and firing missiles. In 2019, she does something completely different but Russia has different standards than pretty much the rest of the world. Uh, and what they do is they fire 
her caliber missiles, those are the land attack missiles, uh, they do a test firing of the missile from the pier. Like they're tied to the pier, they're not at sea, uh, people going about their day at the base, and they launch a caliber missile. And apparently it was a real test, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an accident, and it worked. So they can fire these things from the surface, which we already knew this, but they can fire them from the pier as well if they want to. I don't know what they prove by doing that, but they did it in March, 2019. In October, 2019, they did go to sea and participate in Thunder 2019. And every year they have this war game called Thunder. This is Russia, a little bit of Russian history for you here. And that's where they involve the entire Russian military. This is great practice for their generals and admirals to measure their capability and make sure there's no gaps in their communication. And what they do is they take the you know the, the the marine army portion of their of their forces along with the sea and air force portion they put everybody to sea in a combat state on the pacific coast in the barents the baltic sea the black sea down there by turkey everybody's at sea and they invade themselves with missile support aircraft amphibious landings it all happens at once um, across the globe because it's happening in the pacific at the same time and they're all coordinating via satellite communication and whatnot to see if they can pull off this large invasion of russia basically and they do this every year it's called thunder and it's uh, really cool to watch and the amount of coordination that goes into this is immense and the fact that they're able to do this on a regular basis shows that the russian military does have a high level of competency uh, they're, they're not to be taken lightly uh, other nations including america do similar exercises but uh, the russians do them too all right so let's talk about project 08851m i'm including this in this uh, brief because it's basically a modernization of the yasin project Matter of fact, this is even called Yasin M, is the name of this project. Uh, one of the differences that they did here, and we, I'll be honest with you, we don't know all the differences, but one of the differences is that they changed the large aperture sonar bow sphere to a wraparound array that goes from the starboard side of the bow, across the front, and down the port side of the bow. So it's no longer a ball, it's no longer a sphere, it's more like a horseshoe, but it's even larger because they figured out the larger they make that bow array, the better they can see the Americanskis. And so that's what they're doing now with this new modernization of the Yasin project. They also changed the location of the socks. I've labeled them there with some arrows. Those are non-acoustic sensors. They see things like ship wakes, submarine wakes. Um, there's a radiological isotope detector in there and a couple of other things like a hydrogen detector. And the idea is if they cross the path of where another nuclear vessel had been, whether it's a carrier or a submarine, doesn't matter, nuclear vessel, they're likely to see the, the discharge of radioactive isotopes if they don't see the wake. And that's what SOX does. It's a non-acoustic sensor. Well, there you can see them on the sail, four in a row. On the Yasin, Hall 1, the original, Severninsk, they only had three there, and the fourth one was kind of down a little bit farther towards the deck. And uh, it's not sure why it was placed where it was. Because it's a SOX, non-acoustic, it doesn't have to be in line, so it doesn't really matter. But one of the things they changed here is they got all four of them in a row, which was kind of nice. And also, and I can't confirm this, and I wish I could, but I strongly believe it's true, that they reduced the number of torpedo tubes from 10 to 8. Uh, there's no real reason why I can offer reasons, um, but again, uh, there's no official reason why they would have done this, but you don't need 10 torpedo tubes in modern warfare. Okay. If eight doesn't get them, you're not going to get them. Plus those extra torpedo tubes add weight to the submarine, which slows you down. It also adds a lot of cost to the submarine because it's not just a tube by itself. It's a tube with a lot of other systems attached to it to flood it, drain it, eject it. You know, it's more than just a a tube by itself and it requires a lot of maintenance you know if you have 10 or even eight torpedo tubes their torpedo maintenance division must be huge to be able to take care of all those tubes properly so i believe the modernization program 08851m has eight torpedo tubes all right let's talk about hull one they built six of these or they're building six of these uh, hull one, uh, the keel was laid in 2009. It's called the Kazan. 
She did launch in 2017. So she's into that dry dock of which we have the pictures here for you. In December 2018, she did test missiles in the White Sea. So she's, she's in the water as we speak. In June 2019, she launched torpedoes in the Barents Sea as part of her sea trials. So she's going through the same sea trial process that we saw before, where they test the missiles, they get those checked off, then they test the torpedoes. She'll be testing the uh, escape trunk eventually, if not already, and then be doing her deep dive. She will be delivered to the Russian Navy by October 2020 is the current schedule. Obviously, that could change between now and then if any of these systems fail. But if they don't, she will be delivered to the Navy for operations and war games and whatever they want to do with her in October 2020. One of the changes that they made to the Yasin M project is they took out that scoop I showed you. Okay, so the scoop is no more. It's only on the Severninsk. It's not on the Kazan or any of the other ones. And they just made it flush with the hull there. You can see where the seawater comes in and then the seawater goes out. Uh, notice how where the seawater comes in is always forward of where it is ejected because you don't want to be recycling your own seawater as after you use it. And it's usually at a different height on the submarine as well. It could be lower, it could be higher. In this case, it's a little bit higher than the seawater intake. All right, so hull two is called the Novo Cerberusk. Uh, Keel laid was in 2013, so a long time ago. She did launch in on Christmas Day, 2019, and she's expected to be commissioned in 2020. After that, she'll begin her sea, or sea trials. You know, so she's still at least a year away from being operational, probably two years. All right, and here are the other hulls that are being built right now in Sevmas Shipyard. All of them are being built there. We have uh, the Krasnyarsk, which is K571. It's actually got its hull designation. Uh, it's the third hull. That keel was laid in 2014 and is not complete. We have the Arkhansk uh, K564, which is hull four. Keel laid in 2015. The Perm hull five, keel laid in 2016. And the Yulianovsk in, is hull six, keel laid in July 2017. Again, these four are not finished. They are underway in construction right now. And the Russians have budgeted two more hulls of which have not been laid yet. So they, as soon as they have space in their shipyards, they plan on making two more of these, bringing the total number up to eight eventually. But again, this is all new in progress happening at the time of this recording. This is the beginning of the story of the Yasin and the Yasin modernization. All right, so my final thoughts, uh, let's talk about Yasin Project 885. I think that it was a production disaster. There's no way around it. And it's not any one person's fault. It's not the shipyard's fault. It's not the shipyard worker's fault. It's not the design bureau's fault. Uh, communism collapsed during the production of this submarine. And it was years before they were able to recover from that and then begin thinking about, oh yeah, we have to finish building these ships that are in our dry docks in Sevmas shipyard. And that's... You know, there's, there's nobody could have saw that coming and they did their best to work around it, but it didn't change the fact that it was a disaster. She sat on her keel blocks for over a decade. She had to rip out a lot of that gear that was never finished, installed in the nineties. Uh, a lot of the design, which you cannot change, uh, because the design has been, you know, is already done. Uh, that's been superseded. That's why they needed to have a modernization after they built the first hall, because it was decades later. Uh, Missile testing held up operational availability. Uh, that's because they blame the missile and not the submarine, but something held up operational availability. And to this day, uh, the Russian Navy is not willing to deploy the said Verninsk, that's the original one, outside the Barents Sea. They won't let her come out and play. They want to, we want to bring her into the Atlantic so we can see what she's all about. But the Russians know that too, and that's why they're not doing it. So it's possible that they're hiding something. There could be more to this ship that's not working right than, than, than what we know, uh, just because they're, 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 they're guarding her so close. So whenever she does make a deployment into the Atlantic, of course, we're going to try and get more information on her. And if that becomes public, I'll bring it to you guys here. But as of right now, she is a Barents boat. You know, she doesn't leave basically the shorelines of the Kola Peninsula at this moment. Now, the new project, 08851M, is untested. It could be great. 
obviously they made a lot of changes. They've learned a lot of things from the original Yasin from the Severnets. They've, they've learned that what doesn't work and what does work. They've made improvements. They've made changes. And that's evident in the pictures we have from the dry dock, but we haven't seen them. We don't know what they, they haven't gone to sea yet. They haven't deployed yet. Uh, we haven't even really watched them do sea trials yet. So we'll see what they're like whenever they become operational. Again, this is a work in progress. This is the cliffhanger ending right here. We don't know what is in store for these ships, but as we find out, we'll bring them to you here.